have been listening for a long time and know me very well will know why I am so, 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 so beyond honored and excited and grateful to have this guest, Casey Edwards, who is the author of Raising Girls Who Like Themselves in a World That Tells Them They're Flawed. Casey, welcome to the Miss Mindset podcast and thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me on, Brie. It's such an honor. Oh, it is. An, the honor is all mine. Trust me. I <laughs> am obsessed with the work you do and the book that you created, the book you wrote. And to start, I actually wanted to ask you a question about the title. So I was thinking like, because I'm actually writing a book at the moment too, and the title is such a difficult thing to write because it's got to, you know, get straight to the point, grab attention. And I was thinking for you, from your perspective, there's so many issues these days, right? And obstacles and challenges for becoming a girl who likes themselves. And we've got issues with social media and bullying and, you know, anxiety and mental health and all of the things. So why was it that you chose this title and why is it so important based on all your research that basically we just raise girls who like themselves? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll get back to why that's so important. Don't let me forget to come back yeah. But this didn't start out as a book. This started out as my personal mission, my husband and my, my personal mission. So I co-wrote the book with my husband, Dr. Christopher Scanlon, who's mm -hmm. an academic. Mm -hmm. And when our first daughter was born, we felt so ill-equipped to be parents. It was like, how could we be trusted with something so important? Like who's in mm. charge here that, that they let us take this baby home from hospital? And so I really thought about what I wanted for my girl. And her, her name's Violet and she's 13 now. <sighs> and I kept coming back to, I wanted for her what I didn't have growing up. Mm. And I wanted her to like herself. So mm. if you looked at my childhood, I had all the external markers of success. I had, you know, a stable home. I was good at school. I had friends. But I grew up deeply insecure. I never, mm. ever felt like I was good enough. I was constantly trying to prove myself, hoping that one day I would be enough and I would feel like I was okay. And that followed me into my 20s and, and really to the beginning of my 30s. And I thought, what if I could spare my daughter that? What if she could actually like herself? And so that became Chris and my mission. And we spent 10 years researching it for our own needs <laughs> and because we are researchers and that's what we yeah. like. And then one day we were at a party talking about all of our research because we're journalists as well. So we're mm. very lucky that we can call up anyone in the world, really, and interview mm. them. We did. Yep. Um, and a friend said, I don't have time to read all of that. Just tell me what I have to do. And so that's when we decided to, to write the book. And what became really clear once we consolidated the research mm -hmm. was that absolutely everything, and I really do mean everything, that we hope and dream for our girls starts from raising them to like themselves. So if mm. you want your daughter to be successful, then if she likes herself, she will be successful because she will want to do good for her, not mm. to meet others' expectations. If she likes herself when she falls down, she'll be able to get back up. Mm. If you want your daughter to be kind, then if she likes herself, she will be that because she won't have to tear other people down to feel okay about herself. If you want your daughter to have good relationship choices, mm. then if she likes herself, she won't tolerate anything less. She will know that that's what she deserves. And if you want her to have good physical and mental health, well, if you like yourself, it is natural to love and care for what you care for and value, right? So she mm. will have those things if she likes herself. And so any problem that we're faced with as parents, if you actually build your daughter to like herself, then you've solved it. Oh, so powerful. And as you're speaking about, you know, raising daughters who like themselves, and you mentioned this was bred out of your own personal, you know, your personal attempt to learn to love yourself. For mm -hmm. people who are listening, who like myself, like I am so passionate about what you're doing. I don't have daughters. I don't have kids, but I also am very intrigued. Like how many, how much of this is actually helpful for people and, and the reparenting that must happen? Like when you were doing your research, did you find this would be helpful for any woman out there regardless, oh, because we have to yes, heal ourselves like, to heal our daughters? Yeah. So for me personally, I can 
honestly say I like myself so much more now that I've Mm. researched this, applied the strategies in my own life. And Mm. it is just such a relief to go through life without this constant baggage and burden of insecurity. And I was just overwhelmed when our book came out. On the very first public appearance that we did, we were speaking at a writer's festival Mm -hmm. and Chris and I were walking off stage and a woman came up to us. She probably was in her late 30s and she was crying and she said, I just wanted to thank you. I'm so moved. And I didn't really know what to say, right? And so I said, oh, this stupid thing. I said, oh, do you have daughters? And she said, no, but Mm. I was a girl. And it was was the first glimpse that I got into realizing that this book isn't just for girls. It's Mm. actually for women too. Mm. And I hear daily from people who say that this book has helped them reparent themselves, Mm. but it also explains why we grew up feeling the way we did that it wasn't actually our fault that there's mm. all these structural things and social norms around us that actually create the conditions for us to have low self-belief and low self-esteem and to be insecure but the good news is that <laughs> you can change that yeah like you, with the right strategies and with time and practice you can fix those things mm. and I think When you said, because I know that you have had a little bit of kickback, you've been a little controversial with some of these things because (laughs) it's almost like we actually have to break some of the structural norms, which I'm sure we'll get into. But were there any parts in your research that kind of shocked you because it was going a little against the grain? Um, So the most controversial thing in the book, and Mm. for me, It was so obvious once I read it, Mm. but I didn't realise just how controversial it was and how strongly people want to hang on to this. Mm. And it is the idea that if a girl owns her body, Mm -hmm. then she shouldn't have to do things with it that she doesn't want to do. And what that means is if your daughter doesn't want to kiss grandma, she shouldn't have to. If she does want to kiss her, that is great, you know, and and my girls are Mm -hmm. really affectionate. Mm. But Chris and I ended up on the front page of the Daily Mail in the UK being called the Kissing Police. And it was shocking that in 2022, it is still controversial to say that a girl should not be forced to give affection to someone else. And it's true that is still we're up against. And if you look at grown women, I feel it myself. It happened to me recently. I was walking down the street. A man came towards me, someone I knew, but not well enough to want to hug. And he went yeah. to hug me and I didn't want to. But my conditioning, it's so deeply ingrained. I went Mm. for it and I allowed him to hug me. And I walked away and I thought, if I don't have the skills and the strength to stand up for myself, how can we expect a teenage girl to do that? Mm. You have to learn it Mm. and you learn it early and you learn it in the safe environment of your home. Oh, and I can imagine that would actually force a lot of mothers and parents to have to be quite brave like brave to say to your own maybe to say to your own parents like hey look (laughs) maybe they won't want to hug you and it's you know that would take a lot of balls from the parents perspective too yes absolutely Mm. so we actually have a course that supports our book and we've called Mm. it the brave parents academy and the reason is what we're doing is we are going against the grain Mm. of you know a century of conditioning but the thing is women like this isn't a new problem that girls don't like themselves like we like to go oh it's social media problem women have not liked themselves for generations and if Mm. we want it to be different for our girls we Mm. have to do things differently and that really does take bravery another thing that takes huge courage for parents is to shut down the conversations about beauty and weight Mm. and you know one of the things we talk about is that you know if you want your daughter to build her foundation on other uh, on something other than people's perceptions of her beauty you need to stop talking about her beauty right because that's all we talk about about girls you know Mm. so often and particularly of the grandparents age you know that generation oh you've put on weight oh you've lost (laughs) weight Cheryl at the bowls clubs you know looking young for her age and oh she's stacked it on like it's constant right yeah and my mom is the same and so I had to say to my mum in our family we do not talk about how bodies look we only talk about what they do please stop it and Mm. she got offended with uh, with me and she said but it's such a compliment to tell someone that they've lost weight and I said in my family it's not because what it is is saying to that person I'm policing you 
I'm tracking and it matters. And I do not want my girls to grow up thinking that their body is an object. And so it's been very difficult to have those conversations, but I have, we banned them from our house from the very beginning mm. and, and it works. You know, I see wow. that my daughter is 13 and she has not self-objectified mm. the way so many of her peers have done because her body has never been treated as something that people have the right to discuss and critique. Oh, that is so powerful. So then, and that's kind of gotten to the second, a girl who likes herself has body confidence, which, which was chapter two. Yeah. What? And I think that would actually surprise so many people because we think, oh, you know, if, if we want a daughter or a human to think that they're beautiful, we'll just keep telling them they're beautiful and that will, you know, eventually they'll believe it. And the research does not support that at all. So what would you say as a suggestion to parents yeah. would be better than you look pretty, you look beautiful, you look gorgeous, you look this, like, what would you suggest parents say? Yeah. So to be fair to parents, that is actual advice that some of, well, one of the leading parenting experts in Australia actually tells parents, you need to tell them girls more that they're beautiful. And, you know, I'd just like to ask your listeners, you know, how did that work for you? You know, we were told that we were beautiful, but we all have terrible body image. And the reason is, is that in our, in today's society, nobody is ever beautiful enough. We interviewed two supermodels, and I mean that, real supermodels, and they both had terrible body images. And it's like, wow, if you're not beautiful enough, what mm. hope do the rest of us have? So first of all, the thing is, nobody wins at the beauty game in our society. Yeah. But if we are continually banging on about girls and beauty, then they will assume that that is the most important thing about themselves. So we are setting them up to fail. So what, and the other thing about beauty is it's an external measure. It's something that someone bestows on you and they can just as easily take it away. And mm. they do, you know, mo women know this. If someone wants to criticize you, if they want to bring you down a peg or two, what do they go for? Your beauty, your attractiveness, right? Mm. So, if we want our girls to have real self-esteem, they have to build it on something that can't be taken away from them. It has to be built on something they can control. And that is personal characteristics. It's kindness, it's persistence, it's curiosity. It's all of those things that girls can replicate. It's mm. not someone else's judgment of how beautiful you are. And it's really hard to do this because when you see a little girl, the first thing that comes out of your mouth is, oh, you're so beautiful. Or, look at the hair and look at the mm. curls and look at the shoes. You know, we feel it too because that's what was said to us. Yes. We have a list of suggestions in our book of things mm. that you could say, you know, talk about what they think, what they're doing today, what they did yesterday, or just imagine that they're a boy. Because we can engage with boys very mm. well as a society without mm. talking about their beauty. And with a little bit of thought, we can do that with girls as well. Oh, that is so powerful. And I love, as you were talking, I was just thinking, oh, so true. I've got one of my best friends that's got a four-year-old. And every time I see her, I want to go, look at your pretty dress, look at your pretty plaits. And it's just the first thing. And I really had to like think, outthink my own conditioning to come up with something a little different. And it's so nice just to have that awareness. But I love that you've sort of, it all comes back to, I think, or not comes back to, but it's, I guess this is why it was chapter one. You're saying to mention or bring attention to something that a girl has within her power. So yeah. her attitude, her mindset, her intent, like maybe it's, you know, things that she can control, things that are within her power. And chapter one of your book was a girl who likes herself has a power perspective. Yes. So can you speak about that a little more and tell us what that actually means? Yes. So a power perspective is the idea of thinking in a way that works for you rather than against you. Now, we cannot control everything that's going to happen in our lives. Bad things are going to happen to all of us, right? But the difference between the people who are crushed by that or the people who can get back up is the way they perceive that event and what they do next. Mm. And the idea is that we can teach our girls to think in a way that is powerful rather than being a victim and, and, and just being like a, a boat on a rough ocean being knocked by, you know, what happens to them. And I'll just give you one example that's very simple that happened in our own life and I'm sure it's happened <laughs> in many families. Um, 
our oldest daughter Violet, it was her birthday and she had was unwrapping all of her birthday presents. And our youngest daughter Ivy did what little sisters do, that she was helping and she broke one of Violet's birthday presents. So of course Violet was very upset by that, you know, and that's very normal. But we said to Violet, after we said, you know, that's really sad, I know that's very disappointing, that we can't change the fact that the toy's broken, like it's broken. You know, like as a parent, you want to rush and fix that. You want to go and buy another one. But what you do when you, when you do that to your child is you say, these problems are so big, you can't deal with them. And we deny them the opportunity of learning how to deal with discomfort, right, mm -hmm. which is a skill everyone needs in life. So we said to Violet, we can't change the fact that the toy's broken. But what you can do is choose how you're going to think about it. You can focus on that broken toy and you can be miserable for the rest of the day. Or you can focus on all the great things that happened today, your party, all your other presents, all the people who love you, and you can have a really good day. That's your choice. You have the power mm. to make that. Mm. And it's the same with kids going off to school camp. You know, I see it all the time. You know, there's kids who bound onto the bus and there's other kids who are having panic attacks yep. and you know these kids they're going to the same place mm. they're doing the same thing you know they have very similar capabilities the difference between those kids in most cases is their perspective whether mm. or not they believe that they are going to be able to cope with what happens there whether or not they think they have the power to be okay <sighs> That is so powerful. And I'm thinking about that as you're talking, as someone who was a teacher for so long, camps were literally pole, like polar opposites. It was either the kids who were, like you said, bounding towards the bus and they were excited and they couldn't wait. And the kids that were like, it would undo them. And I think that actually also ties into what chapter five is all about, which is a girl who likes herself is independent and masterful. Mm -hmm. And like, I guess, can you see, or can you explain what the what that meant about mastery and resilience because if somebody I, I'm imagining if a child believes that they're all right if they don't know anyone there they'll be okay if they don't know where they're going to sleep they'll be okay because they've practiced independence mm -hmm. that would also change their ability to see things from a power perspective so could you please touch on a little bit about independence and and the yes. skill of mastery mm -hmm. You're absolutely right, Brie. These, these seven pillars that a girl needs, so each mm. chapter is a pillar, they are interdependent. Yeah, they, they totally. On each other. So mastery and independence comes down to basically self-belief and self-esteem. Mm. And our parents' generation got it wrong. So they thought that you build a child's self-esteem by telling them over and over again that they're awesome. And then once they believe they're awesome, they will do things in life and be successful doesn't work that way mm. self-esteem comes you can't give a child self-esteem we call it word presence you know word yeah. presence doesn't give a child self-esteem yep. self-esteem comes from mastery and independence it's from a child feeling like they can do life that what happens in their life they are able to cope with it and they've got the skills to do life. And as the simple principle to build mastery and independence is only do for your child what they cannot do for themselves. Ugh. And as they get older and, you know, more and more things are added to that list. And I mean, within reason of practicality, you know, like sometimes you don't have half an hour in the morning for your kid to tie their own shoelaces. But yeah. in general, if your child can do something for themselves, you should let them do it because that makes them feel that they can do life. And so then when they confront situations like camp, they will know they can do things and they will be okay. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example of how as Parents, we often get this wrong, and, and we did with our first daughter and our second daughter. So we often feel that we need to protect our children from discomfort and from risk and for fa from failure. Mm. And because we feel their pain too, right? So it's really natural to want to protect yeah. our kids from that. And so when our youngest daughter, Violet, was, you know, two or three in the playground, and she would get really frustrated because she couldn't climb up on a climbing frame. We would run and help her because we didn't want our little girl to be upset. So we would go and we'd lift her up and she would play. 
And we trained her to be helpless. Like we actually taught mm. her to be helpless. She would stand at the bottom of a climbing frame. She wouldn't even try and she'd look around and put her arms up and wait for us to fix it. Mm. Now you project into the future. If we had maintained that, if she's sitting, you know, in class in grade four and she needs to do something that's hard, well, we're not there for her to put her arms up and for us to come and lift her and, you know, to do that challenge for her. She needs to be able to struggle, mm -hmm. fail, struggle again, and then succeed. Mm. And so when our youngest, our youngest daughter, Ivy, was at the park, we had done all this research for our book, so we knew how important it was. We were also busier and more experienced parents, so we didn't yeah. help her as much as well. Yeah. And so Ivy, she was on her own in the playground. She had to sort herself out. And I remember this one day, it was so profound that Ivy, she was struggling to climb a particular climbing frame. And she eventually got on top of the, on top of the frame and she looked over to me and the look of pride and satisfaction and confidence on her face took my breath away. And it was like, oh. that is self-belief. Yes. That is what she did for herself. And every time I went and rescued Violet to save her from her discomfort, I denied her that opportunity to develop that deep soul satisfaction and self-esteem. Oh my goodness. At this one, I think has got to be one of my favorites. I, I love what you're saying so much and it just resonates. And I'm thinking as you're talking about what I see inside the education system and what I see inside of the school system is often, A, as you were talking, I was thinking a lot of kids when they would get to year seven, I couldn't believe I was a high school teacher. Year seven's their first year of high school. And I was like, oh, wow, there's still parents that are coming and sorting out their lockers. Teachers still had to tell them what pens to use, where to go, walk them to classroom. Like there wasn't really a whole lot of independence yet for a lot of children. And I was honestly quite shocked by that in my first few years. But I'm also thinking, so A, it's important that we give them independence from a young age so that maybe a transition to high school isn't so difficult. Yeah, I saw that because my daughter, so Violet started high school this year. And when yeah. I kids who had the most anxiety you know the kids yeah. wouldn't get out of the car in the morning to get into school yeah they were not worried about school they were worried about life skills they didn't have yeah they didn't know how to navigate space yeah. they, they were worried about can I get to my locker and get to my room now mastery and independence by the time you're 13 you should be able to navigate space mm. without the help of a parent mm. they didn't know how to ask for help no. And they didn't know how to take responsibility for their belongings. Now, I see parents, their kids are in grade six and the parents are still carrying their bags. Yeah. And it's like, no, when your kid's three in kinder, they can carry their own bag. Mm -hmm. right? And so those kind of skills, we create problems for our kids if we don't let them develop that because, yeah, when they get to high school, <laughs> they're the kids who aren't coping because they can't do life. It's so true. And then there's also the, you know, mastery is so important. And I, I understood that, but I also could see, and this is just from a teacher's perspective, sometimes there's such limited opportunity to help a child achieve mastery because the curriculum doesn't stop for no one. Mm -hmm. It's like, nope, you failed. You can't do that. Moving on because we have to move on. We have to move on. And that can actually, I found that was so detrimental to that self-belief because they've already formed this, like, I can't do calculus I can't do trigonometry I can't write an essay because I failed it last time and now we've moved on yeah. so I guess my question for you is like have you as a parent who sends this you know sends their kids to school do yeah. you often see that sometimes there's a little bit of a disconnect between some of the things in the system and what your research is showing actually helps yes absolutely yeah Which is why we as parents need to be really intentional in mm. balancing those yeah. things that are happening and one of the most important things that a parent can do one of like a, on your top five list of your job yeah. as a parent is to teach your child to be okay with failure yes because they need to be able to fail and know that failure is the pathway to success Thank and you. get back up again and the number of kids who just are so scared of failure like even the bright kids right they mm -hmm. limit their own potential mm -hmm. because they cannot fail mm. and, and failure it's a feeling of discomfort that mm. your child needs to learn to tolerate mm -hmm. and then this is the key to resilience and I found this 
that is not written very often. I, it was in one podcast with Brene Brown. She was talking about resilience. And she said the difference between the people who get back up and who keep going in the face of adversity when everyone else gives up is the ones that have hope that, yes. that getting back up will serve them. Mm. And the only way you get that hope is by having a long list of past evidence to show you that getting back up actually works. Now, if you don't create situations where your kids fail, they don't get the practice of getting back up. So they mm. don't learn that it that it works. Mm. But then we also need, and we write about this in the book, to help our kids to fail well. Yeah. And failing well is learning that didn't work out that time. What can I do n- differently next time so it might work better? And mm. to keep practicing that. So you learn so you from your own evidence that if I get back up, eventually I'm going to get what I want. Mm, so good. It's incredible. I love this one so much. And I always used to think, you know, I could see a move where it was like, right, that, you know, there's so many kids that are anxious and self-esteem is a big problem. So rather than teach them to cope with failure, let's give everyone a participation badge mm. and we won't keep score. We won't have winners and losers. So then no one has to feel bad. And in my mind, I was like, wait, this is not addressing the problem. Are we actually creating this? We're perpetuating this negative self-esteem. And to me, it just seems ludicrous. Yeah, we interviewed a school, a principal from a school where parents lobbied the school to create more speaking parts in the school musical. So kids didn't get disappointed about missing out on a role. So they actually changed a very well-known story. That's not how the world works. No, no. As soon as you leave school, if you miss out, you miss out. You know, your parents can't call your uni lecturer. Yeah. Oh. They can't call your employer. You know, mm. You've got to learn to deal with disappointment, understand that it happens to everyone, and then to just and to get back up and try again in a different way. Mm. I think that's incredible. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, one of the other ones I want to get through the seven because they're all so incredible and there's so much. There's so much to unpack with each of them. And this one is the one that a girl who likes herself is calm. Yeah. I was so surprised by a lot of what I read inside of this chapter to can be completely honest, like the research, you know, around screens and sleep and all of the things that we think, you know, screens are bad. Yeah. Apparently not. No, <laughs> so, not. Yeah. Not. Let's talk about that. What does yeah. that mean? A girl who likes herself is calm. Okay. So let me just ask your listeners how they feel, how would you feel if you went to work all day and everything you did was monitored and assessed and compared? And then after your day job, you went to another part-time job where everything you did was going to be monitored, benchmarked and assessed. And then you came home and you had to bring your work home with you and you got to do more work. And then you're absolutely exhausted. And then someone's shoving food in your mouth and then kicking you into bed. And then you get up the next day and you do it again. That's what a lot of kids' lives are like. Mm. They go to school where they're living by someone else's rules the whole day, being constantly assessed and compared. Then they go to an extracurricular activity and it happens again. There's no free play. They're following adult-led rules and they come home and they do their homework and then they go to bed. Like, it's not a surprise that our kids are having a mental health crisis when that is their life. Like as adults, when that is our life, when we are overtired, when we are overstressed, when we've got too much pressure on ourselves, we cannot manage our emotions. We cannot sleep properly. We cannot learn. We cannot be creative and we have no joy for life. Hmm. But what we, this is being presented to parents as good parenting. And it is absolutely horrendous. And this is another area where parents need to be brave. Mm. We need to be brave enough to get off the self-improvement treadmill and to give our children a childhood. And so what we mean by that is your child, the one of them, you know, the top five things that parents need to do, and one of them is sleep. Your kid needs to have enough sleep. Mm. If, if your child has any problems with emotional regulation, any problems with concentrating in class, behavior management, mental health, look at their sleep. That is the first place to start. Sleep should be the biggest priority in a child's life, Mm. in their schedule. Sleep, then they need to have time to play. And what I mean by play is free time where they get to control it. 
They get to control what they do in that time without a learning objective, without it being measured, without rules imposed on them. Now, control over your time is absolutely critical for mental health and kids get very little of it. Some kids get mm. none now. Mm. And we need to absolutely prioritise that time, mm. not just for their mental health, but also play is like restarting the brain you know when your phone is overloaded and you need to turn it off and turn it back on again mm. that's what play does to your child's brain so if you want your kid to do well at school don't give them an extra math sheet give mm. them time to play that's mm -hmm. what their brain needs so they mm -hmm. can concentrate the next day in school mm. and so the reason screens are included in this chapter of calm is that a lot of people over schedule their kids because mm. they're so scared of their kid being on screens. Mm. But the research shows that it's not the screen that's damaging, it's what they're doing on the screen. And mm -hmm. if your kid is actually playing on a screen, mm -hmm. they are doing free play where they are in control, where they're being creative, where they're negotiating, imagining, role-playing, building, mm. that is play. Mm. Minecraft is on-screen Lego. Mm. Roblox is on-screen imagination games with your friends. Mm. So don't stick your kid in, you know, soccer class because you don't want them to play Minecraft. Yeah. Let them come home and play Minecraft. And so what we do with our girls, they are they play their computer games and then they're on FaceTime with their friend. And that is play. Mm. That is the communication where they're having to learn to negotiate and get on and imagine and have all that mm. connection. So <laughs> really good things can come from your kids playing on screens if they're doing the right thing. Mm. But as, as, you know, a caveat to all of that is treat the online world like you would a shopping centre. Mm. You wouldn't let a three-year-old stand at the, you know, front gate of a shopping centre and say, go for your life. Mm. You know, we're around mm. and as they get older they get to go a little bit further by themselves and further and further and further so just you know when our girls play online they have to be in the lounge room just so mm. we can have an ear out for what's going on mm. um, and so that's the way that you can keep them safe but also you can just don't, you don't have to feel guilty about your kids playing on a screen take the pressure off and let yeah. them play oh I love that it's so important I think where does that, for the people who have teen, or even like your eldest daughter, probably at that age where it's like, screen is good, understand. Where does social media sit with this whole like play creativity? Yeah. Is there any research there that suggests, like, I don't want to get into the debate of if it's good or bad because it's here yeah. and it exists and that's the, it, it exists. But how can we make sure that within that context of in, encouraging daughters to like themselves, yeah. that there's some boundaries around social media? Yeah. Okay. So the first thing I would say is social media has not created this crisis of body image and self-esteem in girls. It mm -hmm. has just magnified a problem that is already there. Mm. You know, as we said at the beginning, girls and women haven't liked themselves for generations. Mm. In our research, we interviewed, you know, six-year-olds who wanted to slice off the rolls of skin on their stomach with scissors. Four of them said that to us. Mm. These girls have never even looked at social media, right? Yeah. So these problems are starting way before social media. Mm. So and the, what concerns me is when we go, oh, social media is the problem, we're not focusing on the real issues that are happening within the home, the things that we talk about in the body confidence mm. So yeah, social media is a magnifying glass and I'm not saying it's not hard. There aren't problems there. There certainly are. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but the other thing I would say is when our children are allowed to drive, we do not hand them the keys at 18 and say, go for it. I treat social media the same way. Mm. It's really complicated. There's mm. lots of nuances mm. and kids need to learn how to use it and they need to learn it at an age where we are there to protect them and guide them Mm -hmm. And when the consequences for them stuffing up are, are not so great. Mm. And I'll just give you an example of something that happened at my daughter's school. So, you know, we tell kids, you know, you cannot send a photo of someone unless you ask their permission first, right? So that's the plain rule we give to kids, yeah. right? Second day of high school, one boy, he was oh, in no. a change room at school and he asked another boy if he could take a photo of him. 
in his undies. Yeah. And the boy <laughs> said yes, and then he sent it on. Now that comes under child pornography. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like that's yep. illegal. But for the boy who did it, he thought he did the right thing. Yeah. Okay. So wouldn't you? And so it was innocent. And that was a learning opportunity. Wouldn't you rather your child learnt that at 12 and not at 18? Mm. Because if he did that at 18, he could have a criminal conviction. Yeah. Right? So there's so many, social media is part of our life. Whether you like it or not, it's not going away. Mm -hmm. I believe we need to slowly introduce our kids to it and, and teach them the nuance. Another, a really interesting study was about looking at girls' emotional well-being and social media, and it found that the kids who were not on it had worse mental health. Mm. And one of the possible explanations for that is that's how kids connect. Yeah. If you take them off social media, you withdraw them from their peer group, mm. and we know that's damaging. Yeah, so true. Oh, that's so I – fe- I feel like that would be quite a shocking revelation to a lot of people because I think it's very easy to taint social media with this negative brush and it's causing all these issues. I also see that it can be quite a creative outlet for a lot of teenagers. And <laughs> you're right. It's such a social, you don't want them to be socially isolated. So I find I speak to a lot of parents who are like, what do I do? I don't want them to be socially, so socially isolated, but now they're using filters and I don't want her to not like her body. And I think what you're saying is that starts early. That starts at home. The conversation yeah. needs to already be well and truly being had by then. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So, oh, I love that one. So I love all of these. There's so much amazing stuff that you've really unpacked and made it so comprehensive inside of this book. So guys, I'll link this all in the show notes later, but we've got two more pillars. And the next one is a girl who likes herself has strong relationships. Mm -hmm. Please explain. Okay. So this is the idea that social skills don't always occur naturally. You know, like all skills, some people are better at them and some people need more practice. Yeah. And we all know people in our lives who have really poor social skills and they did not learn them in the playground. Now, social skills are absolutely fundamental to your girl's well-being, also to her academic performance. You know, if your girl cannot resolve a fight that she had in the playground at lunchtime, she is not learning maths in class that day, okay? Mm. So the idea is we should not leave social skills to chance. And that they are skills. Friendship, it's not magic. It's not serendipity. It is a skill and we can teach our daughters friendship skills so they can choose good friends. They can be a good friend. They can minimise the chance of being bullied. They can resolve conflict in functional and productive ways. I love it. So that's literally going down to the nitty gritty, right? Like we teach girls that you will look at somebody in the eye and maybe like ask a question or, you know, when you enter a room, this is how you might walk. Like it sounds so obvious, but when, if we even think about it, like, were we taught that by our parents? Was that a conversation that was had? Is it a curriculum? It like actually come to think of it. I was an English teacher and we do teach verbal and non-verbal communication skills Mm -hmm. but it's not within the context of relationships it's within the context of this is what you'll do to pass this test yeah so I mean just the one on eye eye contact and Mm. speaking to people like girls are often rewarded little girls for not making eye contact oh she's shy oh Mm. she's so sweet you know like it's really cute to be shy at six, if you do it at 16, you're just rude, right? Mm, yeah. And again, if you have not been encouraged to develop that skill, in fact, you've been encouraged to do the opposite, mm. you're going to have problems in life. Mm. The other thing, I mean, friendship skills is really important and mm. it was such a revelation to me because the reality is conflict is a part of every single relationship. If you mm. want to have an enduring, intimate relationship with someone, whether it be romantic or friends or even a colleague, mm. you have to be able to deal with conflict. Mm. And girls are not taught how to do that. In mm-hmm. fact, we are given the worst advice, just ignore it. Well, what happens when you ignore it? It festers. So you true. have no self-esteem because you think, oh, well, she can treat me that way and that's okay. Yeah. I don't deserve to be treated well. And then it just like explodes out of us you know pitch behind someone else's back (laughs) or lose control but if 
if we actually knew how to handle conflict, that wouldn't happen. And I was mm. 40 when I learned how to resolve conflict. I was sitting in a friendship skills workshop by the friendship skills expert, Dana Kerford from You Are Strong. I'd taken Violet there. She was in grade one. And I took there <laughs> for Violet and I was sitting there going, oh, oh, is that how you do it? That would have been good to know 35 years ago. Mm, oh, I, you speak in my language. I swear. I always laugh on this. I say in this podcast all the time, one day I'm building a school and I'm thinking I'm going to be looking for you and being like, Casey, do you want to be the headmaster? Because we need to build a school that teaches all this stuff. It would be incredible. It would be so incredible for a girl to be herself, which is the last one. So the final pillar, which is a girl who likes herself is herself. Yeah. I love the metaphor that you use around the seed and the rock, uh, the yeah. seed and the stone. Okay. Would you mind just explaining like, what does it mean to raise a girl who is herself and how do, how do we actually really help cultivate yeah. that? Okay. So <clears throat> it's very easy to be a stone parent. And so when we talk about stone parenting, it means looking at your child as, you know, a precious piece of marble and it's your job to sculpt this perfect image of the child that you think that she needs to be to be successful in life. Mm -hmm. So it might be, you know, my daughter needs to be really smart or she needs to be really good at sport or she needs to be really confident or whatever. You have a preconceived notion of what your daughter needs to be to be successful. And that comes from love, right? It's coming from the right place. And so we're going down our chisel and we're chiseling off their weaknesses and we're pushing them into this and pushing them into that. That's old school parenting, okay? Mm. You know, forcing them into extracurricular activities to develop this. You need, you need to play the violin because it's really good for brain development, you know, if they've got no interest, for example. Mm. Seed parenting, on the other hand, is approaching parenting as if your daughter is this precious, unique seed. And it is your job to provide the right environment. You provide the soil and you provide the structure and the boundaries of the trellis and the water. And, and our job is to nurture our children, but to trust them to grow and bloom in their own way and in their own time. Mm. And that, again, takes bravery, but mm. it is absolutely what our children need. Because if they are going to grow up liking themselves, they need to be grow up to be the best version of the person that they choose to be, not the person that is chosen for them, no matter how well-intentioned that choice is. Mm. So our job is to let go of that ex of the expectations that we mm. might have, that our family might have, that society has, mm. and help to nurture our children to be the wonderful people that they were born to be. And if you think about it, that is giving to your child the thing, the one thing that everybody in life wants most. We all want to be seen, loved and accepted for who we are in this moment. Mm. We don't want to have to pass the test to be good enough. We don't want to have to lose the weight to be good enough. We don't want to have mm. to meet someone else's expectation or jump some hurdle. We want to be good enough now as mm. we are. And if you can give that to your child, you are giving them the world. Oh, you give me goosebumps when you speak, Casey. I absolutely love what you're talking about. And I have to ask for my own interest that uh, these, these just, oh, there's so many things that I read inside of this book where I thought, oh, as a teacher, I can see some parts where we're just, the system isn't necessarily working with these pillars mm -hmm. as a parent. And if you were to build a school, yeah, what are some things that you would change that you think would be a positive outcome? for raising really resilient, really socially and emotionally aware humans who like themselves? Yeah. The very first thing I would do, and parents can do this now just mm. by what they focus on, is get rid of marks and reports. Thank you. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> so oh you do not, your child does not need an external measure in mm. order to succeed. Mm. So let me ask your listeners, what did you get on your grade three maths test? <laughs> you're like nobody knows oh, silly. it doesn't matter right but mm. we put so much pressure on kids we heard stories of kids vomiting before grade three naplan yes over something that doesn't matter mm. what matters is the process of learning the process of mastery and independence of failing of being curious not the marks mm. so 
my daughter's report cards just came out. They don't know what their marks were. We didn't even talk about it. The NAPLAN <laughs> results go straight into the drawer. Now, <laughs> like both my girls do well at school. They do not need marks to motivate them. Mm. What motivates them is our enthusiasm in the learning process. Oh, you're so, oh, I love you. I want you to come and be the headmaster at this school that I'm going to build. This is incredible. And I have to say, as a teacher who spends, you have no, oh my gosh, how many hours you spend writing those damn reports that most parents don't care to read yeah. and marking things. And then the teachers are stressed and then the teachers don't have time to put actual effort into, hey, how can I give some kids more differentiation or in pre, you know, give them more attention because I've got to actually do the marking and the reporting and I've got to put this mark in this system and put it all online so the parents can see it's ludicrous and it's backwards. And there's, there's systems out there. There's countries out there that are getting it right. If we look at Finland, yeah. which are, you know, all the statistics show us there's, there's nations out there that are doing it right. And it's exactly what you said. They're getting rid of that and it's play centric and, yeah. and it's led by the students. So why are we doing this? Just why? Yeah, anyway. so that's wrong. The other thing is stop comparing. Yeah. You know, and I did this myself as a first-time parent. I look back and I shudder at what I did. Violet came skipping <laughs> out of school and she told me what she got on her test. And yes. I said, oh, that's great, darling. What did Sally get? Mm. And what I just said to her in the moment, that her achievement is yes. only good enough if she's better than her friend. Mm. And then we go, gosh, girls are such bitches to each other, aren't they? <laughs> so <laughs> true. When we actually train our girls, we do it as parents, we train mm. our girls to see their friends as competitors and as yep. foes. Mm. Yep. And that's what we do as, a, you know, we we actually give out the medium score to the class. So every time you give marks back, kids look at their grade and then they go straight to everyone else. What did you get? What did you get? What did you get? And then you tell them the average, usually the class average, so they can peg themselves. Yeah. And it's it really doesn't help or it doesn't, align with the research as you and your husband have suggested so yeah. Casey what has been what has been some of the things that you've noticed since applying all of these beautiful techniques and strategies in your home mm -hmm. how has that impacted your family yourself your child like yeah. your children's lives what's the change oh look parenting becomes just so much more joyful mm -hmm. and less guilt inducing you know, one of the best things you can do for your kid is to slow down. You don't yes. need to put the pressure on and to rush around for your kid to grow up to be a successful functioning adult. You don't need that. In fact, you need the opposite. And also, once you become a seed parent, yes. then so much of the conflict goes away because you're helping your child be who they're meant to be. You're going with the grain and not mm. against it. Mm. And so you don't need to fight over things that don't matter. And what you do is you give them your love and support and you watch them bloom. And it's breathtaking to see, you know, it's like a pot plant that you've forgotten to water and then suddenly you water it and then you come back a couple of hours later and it's just blooming. That's what your child can be if mm. you give them the gift of accepting who they are and working with them rather than trying to meet some external expectation of what they should be. Mm. So poetic that behind you have a wallpaper of blooming flowers <laughs> as you were explaining this metaphor. I thought how apt that your wallpaper is covered with flowers. But Casey, I can't, I cannot thank you enough yourself and your husband, Dr. Dr. Scanlon, you have done incredible things on this planet and I can't thank you enough for being here and for the work you've done. Where can people connect with you if they would love to learn more from all of your amazing, amazing We've tools? We've come to our website, raisinggirlswholikethemselves.com. We've yep. got some great free resources on there. We've got a good friend skills checklist, a good friend checklist, which will help your daughter choose friends who are good for her. Another one that's really good is a body image family health checklist. So it's yes. a way for you to look at your own home and see, are you doing things that build your daughter's body confidence or corrode it so yeah come and have a look at those things amazing I'll link it all in the show notes thank you so much for being here Casey I've loved every second of our chat oh my pleasure thank you for helping me share our message for girls to like themselves anytime bye